Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Holidays tend to evolve the longer they are celebrated. What we know as Christmas today started centuries ago, as other separate holidays. Europeans celebrated the winter solstice, while the Germanic people celebrated Yule, a pagan festival held toward the end of December. And the ancient Romans honored Saturn, the god of agriculture, every December with their Saturnalia festival. Eventually, aspects of these winter celebrations were borrowed and blended into one holiday, celebrating the birth of Jesus on December 25th. As times change, so too do our traditions. But even some newer holidays have undergone significant shifts over the years. In fact, in America, one of the most important days of the year for getting together with friends and family also used to be the most mischievous. It originated in New York City around 1863, A new national holiday had just been established by President Abraham Lincoln, and it gave children all over the country some much-needed time off from school. In New York, where impoverished immigrant children were often left to their own devices, that meant time to goof around. You see, these kids would wear costumes, often dressing up like hobos in tattered clothes, fake mustaches, and even wigs. Then they would go around the city knocking on doors asking neighbors for treats. And they weren't just after candy, either. Any food item was acceptable. Apples, vegetables, cake, and in some cases, small toys were happily taken as trophies for their efforts. As the years went on, their costumes became more elaborate. Masks bought from local stores were introduced, as were new themes for their costumes. Some kids dressed up as business workers, while others were made to look like animals. They also didn't shy away from raiding their mother's closets for inspiration. Old dresses and shoes became prime costume materials for both boys and girls looking to go all out on the most fun day of the year. For the most part, the children who participated did so without incident, but there were many who went beyond simply asking for goodies. They would throw handfuls of flour or confetti at people on the streets, or sit on the fenders of cars driving by to catch a quick ride up the block. The more dangerous children weren't above damaging property either, especially if they had been denied food or money while at someone's door. And it wasn't uncommon to see a bonfire in the middle of the street, kids laughing and tossing wooden scraps into its roaring flames. This tradition carried on through the 1800s and well into the early part of the 20th century as a holiday called Ragamuffin Day. Eventually, so many Ragamuffin Day revelers were participating that their march through the streets became known as the Ragamuffin Parade. Adults would come out of their homes to stand on the sidelines and watch the kids walk by, admiring their funny and often unique costumes. Of course, not everyone loved Ragamuffin Day. In the 1930s, for example, the New York Times started running hit pieces on the yearly pastime. As the Great Depression raged on, it seemed in poor taste for children to mock the homeless and the less fortunate by dressing up and begging for food from people who didn't have any to share. And the smear campaign worked. By the mid-1950s, Ragamuffin Day had run its course. But not to worry, it wasn't erased for good. We just celebrate it differently now, as Thanksgiving. That's right, Ragamuffin Day started as a result of the Thanksgiving holiday. Outside of New York, it was known as Thanksgiving masking. And the parade, with its silly costumes and crowds of people, well, that was overtaken by the department store Macy's as their annual Thanksgiving Day parade. But Ragamuffin Day wasn't gone forever. In the 1940s, the concept of wearing a costume and asking neighbors for treats was rolled into a different celebration held one month earlier. Halloween. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus often is quoted as saying, Change is the only constant in life. And he's right. Holidays change all the time. But dressing up and begging for candy from strangers, well, I hope that never goes out of style.
We call them the Founding Fathers because without them, America wouldn't be quite America. In the 1700s, they united the 13 colonies in a revolt against Britain's oppressive King George during the Revolutionary War. We're familiar with one of the most famous, a general who lost more battles than he won, but was successful in leading his men across the Potomac. That man was George Washington, the first president of the United States. There were others, of course. Depending on which list you read, there are seven, maybe eight, who make the list. Over 56 if you add every signature on the Declaration of Independence. Though there's an odd fact. Washington, John Jay, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton did not sign the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Of course, an additional three other documents helped create the United States. The Treaty of Alliance in 1778, the Treaty of Peace between England, France, and the U.S. in 1782, and the Constitution in 1787. Regardless of many founding fathers you choose to consider, they worked together to create a new government. I suppose you'd say that there was a lot of firsts that came from that list. One sat on a committee of five that helped draft the Declaration of Independence. Only one member signed all four documents that helped form the nation. Many were highly educated, coming from Harvard, Yale, and Oxford. But only one held honorary degrees from all three schools, despite having only two years of formal education. There were the inventors in the bunch, too. Mozart once wrote music for a glass harmonica, one of the men created after noticing performers using glasses to create a musical sound. A particularly talented founding father also played the violin, the harp, and the guitar. There were writers as well as artists. At just 16, one founding father wrote a popular newspaper column under a pseudonym as a widowed woman. The columns became so popular that he received several marriage proposals from Boston's most eligible bachelors before confessing his identity. Then there's the avid swimmer who once swam London's Thames. Believing that all children should learn to swim, he later started a swimming school. And because of this, he was posthumously inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame. The very first United States postmaster was also a founding father, as was the ambassador to France, dubbed America's Renaissance Man. There was the fashion trendsetter whose fur hats spawned a fashion trend overseas. America's first celebrity also signed the Declaration of Independence, Whenever he visited Europe, he had no shortage of female admirers who followed him everywhere. At one public appearance, his fans placed a crown of laurels on his head and kissed each cheek. In France, the French National Assembly declared a day of mourning when one founding father passed away. Today, there's a statue of him in Yorktown Square. Count Mirabeau said that he was able to restrain thunderbolts and tyrants. There were abolitionists, too. One kept fighting against slavery until his death, even including a provision in his will that his son and daughter wouldn't receive a penny of their inheritance if they ever kept slaves. And speaking of wills, consider the gift left by one founding father to Boston and Philadelphia. He left the city's 2,000 pounds sterling with an unusual request. The money had to stay in a trust fund for 100 years and used only to provide loans to local tradesmen. That money became worth millions by 1990. That's a lot of amazing history. But the most amazing part? It was all the work of just one founding father. Not many. A man everyone's heard of, but knows so little about. Benjamin Franklin. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.